So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Let's kick off today's joint AFID inter-meeting. If there are no further comments, the agenda is adopted. As this is a joint committee meeting, I'm chairing it together with my esteemed colleague and co-chair, Bernd Lange. Item number two, announcements from my side. Our meeting is, as usual, being web-streamed. Today, we have interpretation available in six languages, English, French, German, Spanish, Polish, and Italian. And like at every meeting, I would like to recall that the interpreters rely on the quality of the sound and video of remote participants in order to get your message across. Please be aware that phone interventions and audio-only connections, unfortunately, will not be interpreted. We come to item number three. I welcome you to this joint meeting of AFID and Inter for a consideration of the draft recommendation for the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. We have already had a very fruitful exchange of views on the details of the agreement with Clara Martinez from the UK Task Force on the 14th of January, and yesterday we had an exchange of views with all committees that presented opinions to the draft AFID Inter recommendation for consent. Let me remind you that AFED and INTER, together with all associated committees, are preparing the Parliament's consent. In parallel, the political groups are preparing a draft resolution accompanying the consent vote. Parliament will do its utmost to ensure a thorough and timely scrutiny of the agreement, as lead committees, INTER and AFED, must ensure that the interests of the European Union, our citizens and businesses, are secured. That's all from my side as an introductory remark, and now I hand over to Bernd Lange. Thanks a lot, uh, David, and I think we are really going forward in this cooperative uh, manner between AFED and INTA, and I appreciate this very much, and I would also uh, use the opportunity to thank to the staff and to, to, to prepare this uh, uh, work, and uh, regarding the complicated situation we are faced with, this is not an easy task, so thanks a lot. And um, in INTA we discussed uh, the issue several times, uh, and I make a lot of points, and our rapporteur will feed these points in our common work. So thanks a lot, and uh, good work for today. Thank you, Bernd Lange. And now I will start giving the floor, first to the AFED rapporteur, Kati Piri, and then the inter-rapporteur, Christoph Hansen, to kick off the debate. Uh, and after that, to the shadow rapporteurs from both committees and then to five other members from each committee applying the De Hunt method and eventually, if time is left, to other speakers who request the floor. And now, Katy Piri, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you very much to both of you chairs. Yesterday, Parliament demonstrated its commitment to the full scrutiny of the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement when 16 opinion-giving committees provided us with their input regarding its content. And on the basis of their thorough assessment today, Christoph Hansen and I present our recommendation for consent on the general agreement and the agreement on confidential information. Let me start by noting that this agreement is a welcome step in the right direction. But this is only the first step. This agreement provides solid foundations, but it can neither be an end in itself nor the end of the road of EU-UK relations. Mr. Barnier and his negotiating team managed to avoid a cliff-edge Brexit while respecting the red, red lines set out by this European Parliament. And their efforts have prevented undue uncertainty for citizens and businesses on both sides of the channel. Because especially in the present context of the pandemic, the impact of a no-deal outcome would have had an extremely damaging and lasting impact on our workers, businesses, citizens, fishermen, as well as on our relations with one of our closest neighbors. The swift adoption and implementation of the Commission proposal on the adjustment reserve will help mitigate the unavoidable disruption caused even with this agreement in place. And at the same time, we have to be clear. We did not want Brexit. We did not choose Brexit. It is with regret that we had to acknowledge the democratic choice of the British people. And in this context, we need to note that this is the first agreement in history that we set up a meeting, a set up negotiated divergence rather than convergence. And the sad but true reality we must face is that compared to EU membership, 
this agreement can only lead to greater friction and more barriers and not less. And this makes effective implementation and enforcement of the agreement all the more urgent. Because as many members of this parliament have expressed yesterday and over the past weeks, areas remain where the parliament needs greater clarity and greater action. And areas also remain where the UK simply refused to engage on its commitments under the political declaration. And chief among these is the absence of an agreement on an ambitious, broad, deep and flexible partnership in the field of foreign policy, security and defence. But as a first step of such continued cooperation, I would urge the UK to continue aligning its sanctions policy with that of the Union and work towards the establishment of a sanction coordination mechanism. Yet I believe also that our relationship must and should run deeper. While the present agreement lacks any clear provisions in this regard, it does provide a solid framework for the development of structural future cooperation in defense and rules-based global order, democracy and peace. This opportunity should be seized urgently. And in that regard, I also call on the UK government to restore trust by ensuring that the EU ambassador in London receives full diplomatic privileges as is customary, which each of the union's 143 permanent representatives around the world. And it goes without question that the democratic role of the European Parliament cannot and will not end after its decision or ratification. Just as the relationship between the EU and the UK does not end with the deal reached in December and the text of the agreement to which we are to give our consent. The myriad of structures established under the agreement and the full implementation of the level playing field require full transparency and continuous monitoring. And they must undergo the only true and reliable test, which is the test of practice. Because we need clear guarantees that the level playing field, in particular as it relates to labour, social and environmental standards, is fully enforceable. And hereby we expect from the Commission to deliver and guarantee the Parliament's crucial role in this agreement, its enforcement and its revision. And I'm coming to an end, Chair. In addition, we must make full use of the agreement's provisions for continued collaboration on the level of our respective democratic representations. And I therefore urge both the European and the UK Parliament to speed up the establishment of a parliamentary partnership assembly where all of our citizens are truly represented. And it is for these reasons, and taking full account of the work and opinions provided by the 16 specialized committees of this House, that Christoph Hansen and I recommend that Parliament gives its consent to the agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. And now I give the floor to Christoph Hansen for five minutes. Yes, thank you very much, uh, David and uh, Bernd, for giving me the floor. And I uh, can be rather brief because Cathy, uh, my co-rapporteur, already uh, made uh, many of the points I wanted to, to address. I uh, think um, we, we are today discussing uh, that Parliament should deliver uh, its consent to this TCA. And this is uh, also in line with all the opinion-giving committees which we heard uh, yesterday. And I would like to thank all the committees for their very uh, valuable input uh, to uh, our uh, work. Um, so, uh, however imperfect this agreement uh, has still the merit of uh, cautioning some of the worst impact that the no-deal Brexit uh, would have had, even though, of course, it can and it will not solve all the problems uh, the UK's uh, exit has uh, caused. So, uh, it will never be uh, in the position and uh, up to the, um, the task to uh, replace or be equivalent to a membership in the, in the club, but that was, of course, the decision of the United Kingdom. So, all in all, I think we can say that the agreement is probably the best basis uh, given uh, the constraints of the sovereign political choices of the UK uh, for future EU-UK relations to uh, and intensify uh, again over time because there are several um, uh, revision clauses and uh, other, um, let's say, meeting dates where some uh, updates will be made. We have addressed some of them already. Uh, fisheries will be negotiated. This has been linked to the energy market and I think there will be several 
um, several rendezvous clauses. So given the unprecedented nature of this agreement, uh, it has as well to be fully understood that Parliament's consent vote will not mark the end of the intense scrutiny by the Parliament uh, of the EU-UK relationship. It is, uh, it is just the uh, ratification, uh, just as the ratification of the withdrawal agreement um, uh, did not mean we stopped watching over uh, and uh, demanding its full implementation. So an uh, unprecedented uh, relationship, of course, requires as well unprecedented uh, institutional provisions that will allow as well for future uh, engagement uh, of the European Parliament in the different uh, nominations, but as well uh, the rendezvous clauses that I mentioned. So the, in, uh, the institutional involvement of the Parliament in the TCA as it evolves is amended uh, and uh, revised. So it is uh, one uh, of the major preoccupations of many of the opinion uh, giving committees, which we heard uh, yesterday. Today. So uh, we will see the Parliament's prerogatives uh, uh, um, to be strengthened, and we trust that the European Commission will uh, take uh, the appropriate commitment to, to this effect, uh, as they did uh, in the case as well for the withdrawal agreement. So I, uh, I think I can inform you as well that there is a letter being drafted by the Conference of Presidents and by the UK Coordination Group, which exactly uh, asks uh, from the Commission for a um, written declaration uh, uh, of. Uh, of for this, uh, this involvement of the Parliament, but that could lead in the future, of course, into a new interinstitutional uh, agreement uh, to be negotiated. That has to, we have to see, but this letter uh, will uh, be uh, sent out um, quite promptly, but maybe David can give some uh, elements uh, there as well. Um, just to inform the committees as well, because many are asking me, um, is this or that part, will it be included? Uh, we will include uh, a short version of every opinion uh, to uh, the, um, the resolution, and then uh, all the, the entire um, opinions will be uh, uh, annexed uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the overall document, so the elements will be all in, and a short version of your opinions will as well be a part of the resolution that we will be voting on. Uh, this is all for my part, and I'm uh, looking very much forward uh, for colleagues uh, to comment, to get uh, their input, and uh, we will try to uh, accommodate uh, as much as we can. Of course, the text has to be uh, coherent, uh, as we did already in our resolution in June, but Cathy, uh, uh, Piri, and myself, uh, we have, meanwhile, experience in that, and we will do our utmost. And thank you very much, and looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you, Cathy, for your introductory remarks as co-rapporteurs. I will now give the floor to the shadow rapporteurs from both committees in group order for a maximum of two minutes each. Please stick to the time. And it's a coincidence, but I start with myself in my capacity as AFET shadow rapporteur for the EPP group. So I will now I will put on my new hat and Bernd Lange will check if it's two minutes and not a single second more. So. For the EPP group as a shadow, let me say the following. The trade and cooperation agreement is not as comprehensive as the EPP group would have wanted it to be. And just as Christoph Hansen rightly pointed out, it is, however, the much, much better, very good alternative to the cliff edge Brexit, and it provides a very high degree of security for our citizens and businesses. Of course, as chair of the AFET committee and shadow rapporteur for this file, I regret the British refusal to negotiate on cooperation on foreign and security policy, as this was an area where citizens would have benefited from reinforced cooperation. Even if there are no provisions on cooperation in this field of foreign and security policy, I believe the United Kingdom still could be associated in a number of areas as a third country and under the conditions applicable to third countries, such as the upcoming European Defence Fund, the EU and the UK could also find ways to continue the established cooperation and information exchange of national authorities in the area of cybersecurity. A final remark. I believe that this TCA paves the way for a series of future agreements, and we can use the framework of the TCA to expand the cooperation in other areas in the future. As I mentioned, for example, foreign policy and security. We should also ensure that Parliament's scrutiny rights and the monitoring of the implementation of the TCA and the withdrawal agreement remain fully respected. 
Our president, David Sassoli, has been actively reaching out to counterparts in other institutions, notably the Commission, in order to guarantee our scrutiny rights. In this vein, AFED and INTER are traditionally the committees responsible for the scrutiny of international agreements, AFED for the political aspects of the cooperation and INTER for the trade aspects, and this should remain as it is. That's all from my side. Thank you. And now I immediately give the floor to the next, and that is Speaker, the Inter SD Shadow, Paolo De Castro. Grazie, grazie Presidente, grazie David. Innanzitutto voglio subito dire che condividiamo l'approccio definito ai relatori, sia Christophe che Catipiri, di elaborare un report il più possibile diretto e breve anche in considerazione del calendario ambizioso che ci siamo posti, vista anche l'incertezza attuale sull'estensione o meno del periodo di applicazione provvisoria. Eh, a seguito degli scambi avuti nei giorni scorsi voglio quindi innanzitutto ringraziare la Hansen per il lavoro svolto e per la condivisione di quelle che sono le priorità del gruppo S&D per quanto riguarda naturalmente la Commissione INTA. Eh, per quanto riguarda invece la governance, il testo sottolinea decisamente l'importanza di garantire un forte protagonismo del Parlamento europeo e in particolare delle nostre commissioni parlamentari, eh, sia nel monitoraggio che nell'implementazione dell'accordo, impegnando la Commissione a intervenire nel caso in cui il Parlamento richieda l'apertura di indagini per l'attivazione di possibili future misure di ribilanciamento unilaterali. In questo senso l'iniziativa lanciata dalla COP di chiedere un impegno sotto forma di dichiarazione scritta, mantenendo aperta anche la possibilità di un accordo interistituzionale, non può che rafforzare le nostre richieste. Non da ultimo, lasciatemi ripetere come il coinvolgimento della società civile, a partire dai sindacati, dalle associazioni di rappresentanza, debba essere strutturale e costante, prendendo esempio dalle buone prassi già messe in campo dalla Commissione con l'accordo di Resso. Grazie Presidente. Thank you Paolo De Castro and now I give the floor to the effort renew shadow Natalie Loiseau please. Merci David, merci Bernd. Euh, il y a quelques points sur lesquels je voudrais insister, je ne voudrais pas revenir sur ce qui a déjà été dit. Depuis quelques jours, nous assistons à une situation qui n'est pas satisfaisante. La première, c'est l'erreur qui a été commise par la Commission en invoquant l'article 16 de l'accord de retrait et en fragilisant le, le protocole nord-irlandais. Cette erreur a été vite corrigée, mais ses conséquences, elles, ne sont pas effacées. Nous voyons en effet le Royaume-Uni exploiter cette situation pour essayer de rouvrir l'accord de retrait. Nous devons pleinement tirer les conséquences de ce qui vient de se passer. Tout d'abord, la Commission doit consulter notre Parlement dans la mise en œuvre à la fois de l'accord de retrait et de l'accord de commerce et de coopération. Elle doit s'y engager clairement et fermement et je soutiens ce que disait Christophe Hansen et la nécessité d'une position ferme du Parlement européen de ce point de vue. Mais aussi, nous avons déjà dit, nous Parlement européen, dans le passé, que nous n'accepterions pas de ratifier l'accord de commerce et de coopération si l'accord de retrait n'était pas pleinement mis en œuvre de bonne foi. Le Royaume-Uni ne doit pas rouvrir cet accord et on, nous savons qu'il doit faire sa part pour l'appliquer de bonne foi et qu'il lui reste du travail à faire. Enfin, sur la coopération en matière de sécurité et de défense, je regrette qu'elle ne figure pas dans l'accord. Nous savons que le Royaume-Uni ne l'a pas souhaité. Nous devons rester prêts à y travailler dans le futur, dans un futur où il faudra que le Royaume-Uni cesse de traiter l'Union européenne comme un punching bag. Thank you, Natalie. Now I get the floor to renews inter shadow, Ms. Licia Schreidemacher. Thank you, Chair. Chairs, and uh, first of all, I want to welcome the deal and it is an unprecedented scope for trade in goods uh, with zero tariffs and zero quota combined with the strong level playing field provisions. 
Uh, but meanwhile, uh, it has been only a month after the end of the transition period, and we have to make sure that not every issue will become an existential issue for our bilateral agreements. And given the current context, it is all the more important that the European Parliament has its say about any possible modifications to the agreements, suspensions or negotiations that are foreseen for part of the agreement. And, European, uh, and um, we have a novel mechanism of rebalancing measures to ensure a level playing field, but we need to ensure that there's a practical way to demonstrate a material impact to trade and investment so that we can, we can indeed trigger, uh, trigger this mechanism and make it a useful instrument. And I welcome the chapter on digital trade, as well as regulatory cooperation on emerging technologies, uh, which should include artificial intelligence. And in the future, we should also explore whether more ambitious uh, rules on services, including professional uh, qualifications, could lead to more stability and certainty for businesses. And once the Parliament, or if the Parliament uh, gives its green light, we still have to see what else can be done to help European businesses comply with all the new rules and procedures. And we are already seeing examples of businesses that stop trading with the UK just because of the complex administrative uh, requirements, sometimes even because of one certificate that cannot be provided by UK authorities. And um, I think, I do believe that there should be more communication between the EU and the UK authorities to prevent this kind of situations, uh, because it is especially burdensome to uh, SMEs. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear colleague. Next is the AFID ID Shadow Rapporteur, Jerome Riviere, for two minutes. Monsieur Riviere is not connected. Then I move on to the Inter ID Shadow, Mr. Campo Minosi. Uh, thank you, President. I will intervene in uh, Italian. Uh, finalmente, nei documenti che hanno redatto le commissioni parlamentari, abbiamo, andiamo verso il buon senso, andiamo verso l'accettazione di un processo che per alcuni è stato, è stato molto difficile accettare in Commissione Europea, in alcuni gruppi politici. Un'elaborazione del lutto per la sconfitta che ha lasciato qualche strascico, reazioni infantili, un negoziato troppo lungo che, 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 che si è complicato con le file dei camionisti che non hanno potuto passare le feste insieme quest'inverno insieme a, ai loro familiari. Ecco, Qualche strascico ce l'abbiamo ancora, la gaff tremenda della Presidente von der Leyen che sui vaccini ha messo di nuovo in mezzo il tema del confine fra Eire e Irlanda del Nord e l'ipocrisia di chi nella mia commissione, quella su, sul commercio internazionale, chiedeva e pretendeva standard di alto livello eh, da rispettare al Regno Unito che era con noi fino all'altro giorno, che ha un sistema di regole molto simile al nostro e facendo quasi finta che non stringiamo accordi commerciali con Vietnam, con la Cina, che su questi, su questi temi ambientali, diritti dei lavoratori e altro, sono enormemente indietro. Ecco, eh, i, i doganieri olandesi che sequestrano il, i panini con il prosciutto ai camionisti eh, britannici sono forse l'immagine più triste di una reazione infantile e stupida. Ecco, lavoriamo con il Regno Unito sull'antiterrorismo, sulla comune appartenenza ai principi fondatori della Nato, alla relazione con gli Stati Uniti, pensiamo a Hong Kong, i diritti umani. Ecco, ci sono tanti campi con cui... Eh, dobbiamo, su cui dobbiamo lavorare e, e, e mandare avanti una collaborazione concreta. Ricordiamoci che esportiamo beni e servizi nei, verso il Regno Unito e abbiamo tutto l'interesse ad avere reazio, relazioni eh, di questo tipo. Ecco, alcuni miei colleghi forse la lezione della Brexit non l'hanno ancora compresa, lo faranno spero presto. Grazie. Thank you. Now, I've been informed that the green shadow in AFET, Mr. Lagudinsky, is not connected. Is that right? Okay. Then we move on to the shadow of the Greens in Inter, Heidi Hautala. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, 
is uh, because most of us obviously uh, think that uh, it is far behind what the EU membership has brought to UK citizens' enterprises. But um, it is um, uh, sufficient in order to be uh, given consent by this parliament. Uh, regrettingly, I say this because uh, it is not, as many have said, a perfect agreement. Uh, two, two things I want to raise here. Uh, this um, uh, scrutiny architecture is really important for the parliament. And uh, as um, it has been said already, uh, this is not the end of the scrutiny. It has to continue, and I think um, the letter that uh, the President has said to the Commission and the commitment by the Commission to give a declaration uh, on the Parliament's uh, rights of scrutiny is a good, important step. But uh, we would definitely want to see this being evolved into a fully-fledged inter-institutional agreement for this unique, one-of-its-kind agreement in the future. So um, I want to raise the question of, of uh, the level playing field enforcement. Uh, we don't know, nobody knows, what uh, the conditions of raising the issue of non-regression in the implementation of the agreement will actually mean. Um, how uh, to define what is material impact on uh, trade and investment is unknown field. But we have to make sure that the UK does not uh, use its competitive uh, advantage by, by a race to the bottom, by lowering its standards. And this is really key to my group. Uh, I want to say one thing about uh, how much I regret for British citizens that they cannot enjoy, the students cannot enjoy our Erasmus program. We have to find future solutions to this kind of uh, failures. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi Hautala. We now come to the two ECR shadows for Afet and Afotiga, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, co-chairs. Um, uh, I welcome uh, the Brexit uh, package. It is not perfect, but certainly a good step forward for, for creation of, of new uh, fruitful and mutually beneficial uh, uh, relationship beneficial because UK is a uh, like-minded uh, country and, and very important in many areas. Uh, I would like to raise, of course, uh, the area of my interest and try to tackle it in good uh, will and uh, good uh, spirit. Of course, I know the lack of uh, um, agreement on uh, foreign security and defense uh, affairs. Uh, I, it does not preclude uh, goodwill on both sides and and can't extend it. For example, by High Representative uh, uh, Vice President uh, Borrell in uh, ad hoc consultations on important uh, issues like, for example, Russia. China or, or, or security, broader security issues. We have to use uh, better also the EU-NATO cooperation for, for, for coming closer in, in our issues. I welcome naturally the, the, the agreement on exchange of classified uh, information, but I think that for both sides it uh, poses uh, additional difficulty taking into account the uh, very difficult international uh, situation, influence of uh, um, adversaries and 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 uh, many many global players uh, to tight our uh, to to make our systems uh, tightened. In this respect, I, I would uh, warn uh, once more against uh, Russian influence on our society as well of eventual additional influence of uh, Chinese espionage, uh, open uh, attempts to to to, um, to conclude the CAI. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Fotiga, and now Get Bourgeois as. Thank you, Chair. 
So we have a deal. I'm not happy. I'm relieved. A hard Brexit is avoided, so we should give our consent. Although um, the deal is not as comprehensive as we wanted it, and although there's a lot of uh, insecurity due mostly to the late closing of the deal and to the fact that uh, the UK is not prepared, uh, we should also keep in mind that Brexit is not that soft, is not so soft. There's a lot of problems for trade, for citizens, for students, and so on. And above these problems, there are now the recent tensions on Ireland. So our role of Parliament is, of course, uh, the scrutiny and is controlled compliance uh, with uh, the deal, but uh, we should play a role um, in lowering the tensions, in elaborating a good partnership. I'm convinced that the younger generation of the UK later will decide to come back. So it's our role in the parliamentary dialogue to strive for a good uh, partnership with the Brits and um, uh, the parliamentary dialogue should play an important role. I call on to make work of it. Thank you. Thank you, Gert Bourgeois. And now we finally come to the two shadow rapporteurs from the left. First for AFET, Marisa Matias. Thank you, Cher. I'm sorry my connection is not so, so good, so, so I'll... Uh, I'll f follow without uh, the video. Uh, I also want to wel welcome the proposal and to thank the work of the rapporteurs. Um, of course, this is not the deal we wanted, but uh, we do agree that to have this deal than none, none, no deal at all. Uh, we also support the approach which was uh, already presented by several shadows on full transparency and the guarantee of scrutiny during all the phases of the application of the agreement. And uh, uh, I also want to highlight there are some positive dimensions like the maintenance of some levels of environmental protection and labor protection, which we do consider very important. So in order not to repeat what has been said by other colleagues before, I would like to emphasize the issues related with Euroatom Treaty and uh, democratic deficit. Uh, so in that sense, I would like to ask if can, what can we do in order to guarantee uh, that we don't have this democratic deficit as the fact that the cooperation on, on the safe and peaceful uses of nuclear energy under the Euratom Treaty does not provide a vote for, or nor a vote, nor uh, neither a vote nor a, a role for the European Parliament. So, in that sense, I'd like to ask how can we solve this and and be more active in the sense that uh, this, as an important part of the agreement, is not just left um, behind the capacity of scrutiny from the European Parliament. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear colleague. And now we come to our final speaker in this round, Helmut Schultz. Thank you, Chair, dear colleagues. And I want to thank in particular the two co-rapporteurs for the inclusive work they have organized during all the process. And a lot has been already said during the whole working process and the debate today and, and, and before. Uh, the resolution is aiming to be short by talking on board only two paragraphs from each specialized committee which we heard yesterday, we run the risk to leave out important content. Let us phrase our resolution in a way that it provides guidance for later dispute settlement or even court decisions. We should make clear what interpretation of the text by the European Parliament made it possible to give consent. And we must emphasize that any amendment to the agreement requires prior consent of the European Parliament. Uh, my group deplores that there is no mechanism for dynamic alignment in the agreement, uh, what will no doubt lead to court decisions in future. Let us therefore talk on board, uh, take on board relevant passages from the instance Ample, Liebe, Envy, Econ, Agri and Pesch committees to give the court uh, guidance. My group is alarmed also by announcement by British government members to test the waters 
for possible derogation from EU legislation. Let us express therefore very clearly in our resolution in particular with regard to workers' rights. The non-regression clause on labor, social and environmental standards forms a precondition to our consent, makes the trade unions and the civil society organizations strong watchdogs during the implementation of the agreement. They should be the crucial when it comes to defining what constitutes a significant impact. We ask for a dedicated declaration by the Commission in this regard with a commitment against social and environmental dumping. And finally, on final services, a government with a clear deregulation agenda should not receive carte blanche on financial services by the European Union. We ask the Commission to commit itself in a declaration to observe safeguarding standards in any aspect. We are concerned regarding the north of Ireland and attempts by London to shift the border across the island. And the recent experience with triggering the Article 16 by the Commission blocking export to vaccines has fueled conspiracy among radical unionists. That should be not the future of this agreement. So, and probably, that will not be the last time for us to deal with the EU, um, United Kingdom trade relations. Our resolution and ratification process will close a chapter, but not the story. Thank you. Thank you also, Helmut Schultz. So, this concludes the first round of speakers, and I would now suggest that I give the floor to the Commission in case there are some questions colleagues have raised which need to be answered. I would like to give the floor to Antonio Fernandez Matos from the UK Task Force. If you would like to contribute now, please, sir. Mr. Fernandez, please press on your speak button at the bottom of the page. Yes, good morning, Mr. McAllister. Uh, good morning, many thanks. Um, perhaps I would, if you allow, pass the microphone to Marie Simonsen, um, who would start with uh, our, our responses, um, notably in regard to the role of the European Parliament, which um, I think has been raised by several of the um, members. And then we would take uh, subsequently uh, the more technical questions. Okay, that's fine. Then, uh, Ms. Simonsen, please. Thank you very much, uh, President, honourable members. Uh, thank you for all the, the, the comments. Uh, for the Commission, the key priority is now to implement uh, this agreement, including setting up of the joint bodies, uh, etc. It is a very special agreement, uh, just like the withdrawal agreement was. And uh, of course, uh, we fully acknowledge that there must be a special role uh, to uh, the European Parliament uh, also in this uh, context. Uh, so, as for the uh, modalities in place for the withdrawal agreement, the Commission is intending to give full effect to the European Parliament's role to be informed closely about the implementation of the agreement and, in particular, the work of the joint bodies. So, the European Parliament shall be put in a position to exercise fully its institutional prerogative in accordance with the treaties. And in this context, uh, the Commission is, of course, uh, ready to keep the Parliament informed of the work of the joint bodies under the TCA in the same way as it does uh, in the context of the withdrawal agreement. And uh, the practical modalities are, of course, yet to be determined, uh, but the intention is to follow the same arrangements of briefing, debriefing before and after the meetings of the joint bodies, to share all documents pertaining to the meetings of these bodies at the same time as we share them with the Council. And this includes draft agendas, proposals of council decisions, uh, establishing the union position in the bodies, uh, draft decisions, uh, minutes, uh, and so on. Uh, so we believe that this uh, uh, will ensure that the European Parliament is timely and fully informed of all the developments regarding the agreement's future life. And we are committed to ensure the same level of transparency and sincere cooperation as we do now. Uh, just a very short uh, a word on the civil society and especially the parliamentary assembly. 
So we have the framework for establishing the parliamentary assembly, uh, which is a framework. So we hope that uh, that the parliamentary assembly will actually be established between the two parliaments uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and for the civil society dialogue in the TCA, and uh, we, we have all uh, committed uh, to consult civil society organizations on the implementation of the agreement. It follows a similar approach as all modern international agreements negotiated by the EU. Um, and it includes uh, a balanced uh, representation of employers, uh, associations, trade unions, and other organizations such as uh, NGOs. Uh, so that, that is all for my part now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simonsen. I don't see further requests to take the floor now from the Commission or EAS side. Pardon? Pardon. Oh, Mr. Fernandez, you want to come back, please. Perhaps on a couple of the of the more specific questions that uh, that have been raised by by the members uh, briefly, um, we we understand, of course, uh, your uh, concern um, that, of course, the, the the agreement will generate disruption. Um, unfortunately, um, this is the result of the uh, choices that the UK has made. Um, this being said, the agreement is a global agreement that covers all the areas of, of cooperation, except, unfortunately, as well, uh, um, CFSP and CSDP, and our colleague from EAS uh, should be able to come in later to, to cover that. Um, of course, now implementation of the agreement is what will be key, and as, as some uh, of the honourable members have indicated, there are some uh, upcoming uh, uh, developments also on, on that front that we will have to, uh, to deal with. Um, but knowing that the situation, the reality has changed and that business will have to adapt. Specifically, there was a question on artificial intelligence. Um, there is no explicit coverage of artificial intelligence in the digital trade part of the of the agreement. Uh, we do cover a uh, uh, regulatory cooperation mechanism in the area of digital trade, which is uh, not close to specific issues. It refers explicitly to emerging technologies, so there we have a possibility uh, to cooperate with the UK on this matter. Professional qualifications are covered. Uh, they are included in the agreement, Article Serving 513, uh, which provides for the possibility for the parties to develop arrangements on the conditions for the recognition of professional uh, qualifications, as uh, then uh, 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 by a decision that would then become an annex to the agreement. But this would not lead to the automatic recognition of, of qualifications, simply set out the conditions under which the authorities would um, adopt those uh, recognition decisions. It's again a consequence of the, of the choices of, of the UK. Uh, in the same way as uh, the question of the ham sandwich, which uh, indeed is a sad picture of the consequences of, of Brexit, but inevitable, all of the union SPS rules must apply uh, with regard to goods that uh, um, are to enter the, the union. And this is one of the consequences for which there can be no uh, exception. Uh, finally, on SMEs, uh, SMEs are dealt with in the in the agreement uh, through a chapter that is there to facilitate their access to the opportunities created by by the agreement. But of course, the opportunities here are not comparable uh, to what we usually have in our in our agreements, because as some of the members have remarked, we are facing a worsening of, of conditions, no longer frictionless trade, the cost of doing business will go up and business will need to adapt. This being said, the agreement provides for tools, for example, provisions on information sharing, uh, a link to public procurement notices, searchable databases by tariff uh, nomenclature, uh, the establishment of contact points. So we will do as much as we can to help business to face the new realities uh, to which it now has to adapt. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Now, Mr. Salomonson from the External Action Service has indicated his wish to speak. Please. Mr. Salomonson, please press on the speak button at the bottom of your page. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Lang, honorable members. Uh, very grateful, first of all, for 
all the suggestions and proposals that are made and, and the references to the areas of importance in CFSP, CSDP. Um, and um, we gladly take those on board to follow up on. Um, as you are aware, this UK government refused to negotiate a legally binding framework on foreign policy, security and defence, even if the joint political declaration did show some ambition in this area. Having said that, I think it's important to, uh, to underline that the TCA is not completely void of CFSP elements. Uh, we have the essential elements, the political clauses, and a separate chapter on cyber security, which give us a first solid basis to start exploring ways for, for dialogue and cooperation with the UK. Um, you've mentioned areas like human rights and cyber security, uh, but there is also counterterrorism, small arms, light weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and most serious crimes of concern to the international community in the text. Um, the text also foresees the possibility for dialogue and, and cooperation in the context of multilateral fora, so we intend to make use of those possibilities. But uh, of course, indeed, on the other topics, and you've mentioned important topics like sanctions, uh, but I also think of consular cooperation, development cooperation, nothing is foreseen and a way forward is needed as well. That is why the, the High Representative Vice President has organized an informal fact lunch uh, at the end of, uh, of January to discuss, to understand how the Member States also see this way forward. Uh, we, we have to know that the UK is an important partner, and, and you've referred to it several times, um, an important partner in the international arena. And at the same time, we should be aware that it is positioning itself as an autonomous global player. And we need to organize ourselves on how we deal with this new situation. During that lunch, the High Representative, Mr. Barnier, and Vice President Sevcevic all stressed the point that there is a need for unity and coherence which was picked up by quasi all intervening member states. Unity was the key to our success in the negotiations in the past, and we should keep continue to strive for it also in the areas of CFSP and avoid letting ourselves be dispersed. There was also broad agreement among member states that in the short term, we need pragmatism to cooperate in an ad hoc member. And I particularly pick up on the points that you made uh, in this, on this uh, with the UK, where it is in, in our interest. Uh, Ms. Fotiga mentioned important topics like China, Russia, transatlantic relations, uh, which we gladly take on board. I think of crisis situations, of course, like COVID, et cetera. Uh, so that is, the, I think, the approach we need on the short term. I also want to uh, thank Ms. Fotiga on her uh, warnings concerning exchange of classified information. I can tell you that our security experts are negotiating the implementing arrangements of the Security of Information Agreement as we speak, and they will for sure heed your advice. I would also like to thank Ms. Piri for the support for our ambassador and our EU delegation in London. Uh, I can tell you that on the establishment agreement granting reciprocal treatment based on the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations is standard practice between equal partners. And we are confident that we can clear this issue with our friends in London in a satisfactory manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Salomonson. No further requests in the moment to speak, so I can now happily hand over to Bernd Lange. Thanks a lot, uh, David. This was the first round of intervention. Now we have the second round. It's based on the uh, established uh, list of uh, uh, speakers based on the hunt and the request by the political groups. And uh, the first is uh, Michael Gala für eine Minute, bitte. Well, as always, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Assuming that the 16 committees that have been involved have tasted one ingredient each of this pudding and considered their bite uh, digestible, we have to assume, or at least hope, that now where we put it all together, that it is, will still be digestible in its entirety. I hope the Irish border issue will not spoil this pudding and not deliver a pretext for anyone to cause tensions, but we must all insist on its proper implementation and avoid improper Article 16 references from whomever. The agreement leaves potential for more cooperation, for win-win situations, not for cherry-picking constellations. I regret that in the area of foreign security and defense policy, we are not yet where we could have been, but I'm confident that common NATO and OSCE membership and broadly convergent threat assessments 
the will of our industry to cooperate and also the issues that have been addressed by the EAS just in a moment ago, that will open ample opportunities to work together in multifold areas between the EU and the UK. So bon appétit for this pudding. So the next two are not connected um, to, due to my information. So then it is Margarita Marquez for one minute, please. Mrs. Marquez, please press on the speak button at the bottom of your page. So, uh, Margarita, we will try again if, uh, when you are uh, back uh, on screen. Uh, so, I switch to the next. It's Svenja Hahn aus Hamburg um, für eine Minute. Please press the speak button. Voila. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the rapporteurs and shadows for your hard work and leading the scrutiny very careful. It was very helpful, especially yesterday, to hear the opinions from the different and conclusion from the different committees. And it's clear what's been clear before, uh, no deal can be as good as an EU membership. But it's clear to me that in many areas, it still needs a lot of more work in the, in the time to come. But for now, that we should support this agreement. But I would like to know more about something that got me concerned yesterday. It was in the uh, opinion from the ENVI committee regarding the emission trading system. Uh, with the UK having a different emission trading system, the need to harmonize that with the EU emission trading system will be of high importance. Otherwise, the trade with the UK might be seriously affected by the planned carbon border adjustment mechanism. I was wondering how the Commission is planning to address that. Are there bilateral discussion plans? I really encourage you to take that into consideration plan in the CBAM, because otherwise I am afraid of even more serious effect on European businesses and supply chain that already have been affected quite a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot and greetings to one of the loveliest city in the world. Um, now we are trying again. Uh, Margarita Marquez, yeah, for one minute, please. Merci Bernd. Euh, D'abord, merci pour l'organisation de ces, de ces réunions. Je pense qu'il a été très très intéressant le travail hier et aujourd'hui. Euh, je remercie aussi toutes les informations de, du côté de la Commission. Mais je voulais soulever deux points. Euh, le premier sur euh, les capacités du Parlement sur le scrutin euh, sur le futur de cet accord. C'est-à-dire, c'est pas seulement le, assurer le scrutin maintenant et le travail que nous sommes en train de faire. Mais il est clair que le Parlement européen doit avoir un rôle dans le futur pour le scrutin de la mise, mise en œuvre de cet accord. Parce que c'est clair qu'il euh, faut effectivement contrôler le respect des principes, des targets sociaux, etc. Il faut vraiment avoir cette capacité de scrutin. Mon deuxième point, c'est sur le programme Erasmus. Euh, je pense que soit dans le futur, soit dans la mise en œuvre, y compris dans la mise en œuvre du programme Horizon, qu'un effort doit être fait pour assurer que dans le futur, une coopération existe entre les universités euh, des deux côtés euh, de la mer, du canal, c'est-à-dire de euh, l'Union européenne et euh, du Royaume-Uni. Cette coopération avec les universités, cette mobilité est essentielle pour le futur. Merci. Merci beaucoup. And uh, next is Barry Andrews, also for one minute, please. Uh, thank you, Bert. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Article 16, but not really to reflect on what went wrong, uh, but to discuss how we can mitigate uh, the damage that was clearly done to the protocol. We can't ignore that damage. We can't stick our heads in the sand. 
So I will be circulating later on to uh, MEP colleagues proposals for the future. And it's based on what we must not forget, that the Northern Ireland Assembly will vote in four years' time on whether to roll over uh, the protocol to the withdrawal agreement on Northern Ireland. And it is critical, therefore, that we develop connective tissue with the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, here in the EU institutions in order that we sensitize the institutions to the delicate constitutional architecture that was created by the Good Friday Agreement. So I hope that colleagues can support that. It is future focused, it is solutions focused, and we have said consistently that we will not ratify the future relations agreement until the withdrawal agreement is fully implemented. Now, I'm not threatening uh, to block ratification or to vote against ratification, but that's a serious issue and it cannot be ignored. Thank you, Chair. Thanks a lot, Barry. And now it's um, Madame Sofko, and she's here in the room. One minute, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I would first like to congratulate the EU on negotiating team and the European Parliament Brexit Steering Group for defending our interests so vividly. Nonetheless, what struck me is the lack of preparedness from the British side to include a clause on the cooperation on foreign policy issues. A key of our future relations with the UK is a foreign policy alignment. And the earlier we start working on it, it's better. The British departure from a common foreign policy has implications for our own strategies. Although the UK will leave missions such as Altea, they will remain visible in our neighborhood. British are good at diplomacy, and while they might spread the message that it's okay to leave the European Union, we need to convince the Western Balkan countries to proceed on their enlargement agenda. Another unfortunate development on the deal is the UK departure from Erasmus+. Plus. As mentioned in our cult opinion, the decision to leave the program is significant loss for the exchange of culture and knowledge. Our friends in Northern Ireland can already benefit from the Irish financial solidarity, but also Scotland and Wales stress their interest to stay in the program. I sincerely support the idea to offer a hand to those still willing to remain, as I was one of the beneficiaries of Erasmus program when a student in London, and know what benefits that exchange had on my British colleagues when returned from the EU. Thank you. Thanks a lot, dear colleagues. I have to remind you that you have to wear your mask also if you are speaking. We are only the chairs are allowed to take them away. Um, so, next is the well-known Danuta Hübner. Is not there? Unbelievable. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it's uh, Mr. Pujimon for one minute, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, managing a failure is not easy and nor pleasant. The EU has not been convincing in the face of those British citizens who decide to end their relationship with the Union. The EU-UK trade agreement seeks to make up for this failure, and in this sense, it is a good exercise and a proposal worth considering. It is a positive proposal, but incomplete, based on a very traditional principle of European politics, to adapt to a reality in the least painful way possible. Europe will take a giant step when it changes this resignation and decides to intervene preventively, to be a generator of new realities and not to resign itself to being its administrator. It is much better to prevent problems rather than to try to, think, to find a solution once they have already become too big. This agreement is a step forward and we have to thank the work made by the negotiators. Yet, we all know we are managing a failure. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And um, I have now no further requests for the floor, and I have also no catch the eye uh, request here in the room. Uh, just one question back to uh, the Secretariat. So there are no further members on the list. Okay, then we switch for the answers to uh, the questions by the members to the Commission. Or is there another? Mr. Kelly is there from Ireland. Sean, two minutes, please.
Mr. Sean, please press, press the speak button. Okay. The Northern Ireland Protocol is a product of compromise to find a Brexit compatible with London and Brussels that would fit with the particular situation in Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. It is not perfect, nor are we under an illusion that it is, but it is a compromise that stands as the only tangible solution presented. The protocol should not be renegotiated, as has been suggested by the United Kingdom Cabinet Minister Michael Gove, who is seeking significant changes after the fallout from the Commission's ill-advised proposal to Triple Act 16. But in fairness, he is going too far and only using it as a pretext. We need strong political leadership to utilise existing structures in the agreement to ensure the protocol functions in a way that works for everyone, north and south, and the island of Ireland, as well as for the EU's external frontier and protection of the single market, which is paramount. The legal and technical requirements of the protocol are one thing, but if this week has shown us anything, it is the fragility of the political dimension, especially in Northern Ireland. The Commission's decision last week, which had nothing to do, unfortunately, with the local situation, as there were more vaccines in Northern Ireland than in the Republic of Ireland, dramatically increased tensions as it provided a template how Northern Ireland would be used in unrelated EU-UK disputes. And let's not be under any illusion, the United Kingdom are going to use every opportunity to undermine the protocol, and indeed the agreement parts with it don't suit them. Brexit is, and always will be, a delicate balance. So for the agreements in place to be sustainable, there needs to be sufficient political engagement, and I believe the European Parliament should have an active role in dialogue. Just look at the expertise that we have, as opposed to the Commission, when you're talking about knowledge on the ground. All the MEPs who spoke yesterday have practical knowledge. Uh, the Commission are in a bit of a bubble. Communicating more with the European Parliament will avoid any mistakes like that in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Perfect, Sean. So now we have uh, Katharina Bali back, and then we have one request for Catch the Eye. So, Katharina, bitte, für eine Minute. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I was sorry, I was stuck in a different meeting. Um, my question is related to data protection. This is a topic that is not uh, not uh, covered yet by the agreement. And I wonder um, how the relationship between the UK and the US is going to um, be, be seen in regard to a future settlement, because we know that the uh, that UK is trying to, um, to reach an agreement uh, with the USA there. And um, how can we find a, a ground of adequacy um, if uh, the UK moves towards the US regulations? It will, I think, um, necessarily move away from European regulation. Uh, maybe you could elaborate on this a bit. Thank you. Thank you. And now for Catch the Eyes, Mr. Millian Mon, for one minute. Gracias, Presidente. Quiero dar las gracias en primer lugar a a los ponentes, a Katy Piri y a Christopher Hansen por su, por su trabajo, el buen trabajo que han hecho y el buen trabajo que van a llevar adelante, como estamos seguros. Por otro lado, coincido con otros, entre otros, con, con Miguel Galler y con, también con, con nuestro presidente, con McAllister, en el hecho de lamentable de que los británicos no hayan incluido la política exterior de seguridad y defensa en el acuerdo. Creo que juntos, o al menos coordinados, somos más fuertes ambas partes que por separado y creo que espero que en el futuro pues, se corrija este problema, o si no, de forma pragmática, se pueda trabajar en el ámbito de la política exterior en coordinación con ellos. Y finalmente un ruego, un ruego a los ponentes que tengan muy en cuenta, por favor, en su resolución, los puntos de pesca. Han sido, nos, como todo el mundo sabe, uno de los asuntos más controvertidos del acuerdo, más difíciles, Y me gustaría que este, que este punto, la cuestión de la pesca, tuviera un papel importante en la resolución que esperamos. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot. So this concludes uh, the round of the uh, requests and comments by the members. And I give back the floor to the Commission, starting with Marie Simonsen from the UK Task Force. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I would just like to come back on the comment of the Honourable Member concerning the European Parliament scrutiny in the future. 
because uh, we have provided uh, in the horizontal governance framework uh, for coverage of any future uh, agreements that are linked up to this horizontal framework. And that was one of the most important uh, points in the negotiation so that we don't have a patchwork, but everything can fit into this framework. And this framework obviously um, provides uh, for the parliamentary assembly uh, that is going to be established now and uh, civil society. Um, and we will, of course, also continue uh, the way we inform uh, the parliament and we intend to do under the TCA with these uh, linked up agreements. So all that should continue the same way in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And to Mr. Fernandez Matos, please. Yes. Um, so many thanks for those uh, further questions. I will I will take um, a couple of those. Um, first, I think there was one on on Erasmus. Um, indeed, we we regret as well. The Commission regrets that uh, the UK uh, chose not to continue participating in Erasmus Plus as would have been uh, possible in accordance in accordance with the rules applicable uh, to third countries. Uh, that was again a UK choice. Um, of course, the, our door will will remain open. Unfortunately, it is not possible uh, for Scotland and Wales, even if they wanted to, to participate separately from from the UK. Although, as you know, um, there is a solution of which the Commission is aware to allow to allow Northern Irish participants to benefit from Erasmus. So that is the situation. Um, with regard to adequacy, uh, as you know, there was not sufficient time in the uh, in the uh, time we had allocated for the negotiations to, in parallel, have the adequacy decision uh, adopted uh, in time to be uh, enforced uh, by the 1st of January. So what we agreed was to give ourselves more time. Uh, providing for a transitional arrangement that is provided for under the, the TCA, according to which the UK will uh, not modify its, uh, its, its rules. And on that basis, we would, um, we would uh, maintain the adequacy of the UK for a period of four plus two months, so in total six months, during which we would finalize, um, in principle, the adequacy uh, decision, which, the, which would then come in at the, at the end of that, of that period. Of course, as part of uh, the analysis on adequacy, uh, then, uh, well, the, the, the rules uh, that apply and the procedures that apply will be uh, 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 relied on by, by, uh, by the Commission. Um, of course, one important element of of uh, that assessment is the uh, safeguards applying to onward data uh, transfers, and uh, it is clear that we would not be we would not be able to to accept a situation where the data of Europeans is sent to the UK under an adequacy uh, decision and then further transfers to another third country. So this is why we will be very attentive to that aspect uh, in the adequacy assessment that is um, that is conducted. Um, Moving on uh, to uh, the question of Northern Ireland and more specifically to the protocols so that takes us uh, to the to the uh, withdrawal uh, agreement, I would I would just say as uh, as uh, some of the members that have spoken had uh, also indicated uh, that the union has uh, always and remains fully committed um, to the uh, objectives of the protocol on Ireland Northern Ireland as a cornerstone of the withdrawal agreement and as the only way to protect the Good Friday Agreement uh, and uh, therefore peace and stability and uh, avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland. And it is with this in mind that we uh, negotiated this as part of the withdrawal uh, agreement um, at the end of last year, uh, 2020, uh, the EU and the UK, in the framework of the of the Joint Committee, as you know, agreed a set of uh, workable implementing solutions, uh, temporary arrangements in a number of areas. For example, example on export health uh, certificates and chilled meat uh, products in the form of grace periods, essentially to give uh, supermarkets, uh, other stakeholders that were not fully prepared, some extra time to adapt the supply and distribution chains. Um, these agreed solutions um, 
are temporary in nature. They are subject to strict conditions uh, during those uh, grace periods, of course. And uh, But I think they show that the Commission is working constructively uh, with the UK, uh, within the Joint Committee, looking for pragmatic uh, solutions, but always within the framework of the protocol and of EU law. This is, uh, this is very important. Um, the way forward is full uh, implementation of the protocol by both sides. This remains uh, our conviction um, and also that this is uh, essential uh, to maintain clarity and to maintain stability for businesses, stakeholders in Northern Ireland and Ireland, while at the same time minimizing the disruption inevitably caused by Brexit. Thank you. I would leave that at that. I think um, colleagues may, may come in uh, notably to deal with the level playing field questions that have been raised. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I think uh, there were also some remarks and questions to the uh, EAS, and perhaps um, uh, Mr. Salomonson uh, would reply. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, I listened carefully, of course, to the remarks of uh, Mr. Galler, uh, uh, Mrs. Zovko, and uh, Mr. Milan Mon. Uh, but uh, I, I really don't have anything to add to, to what I said before. Um, we will have to take uh, this forward, and of course, uh, we uh, we will do everything we can to to avoid uh, possible negative spillover effects uh, on other on other areas and other domains. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And there is a request uh, from uh, uh, Miroslav Gilois. Uh, good morning. I hope you can hear me well. Perfect. Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, okay. Um, let me start by confirming that level playing field has been the EU priority in the negotiations and will continue to be in the implementation of the agreement. And this is reflected uh, also in the fact that we have so many unprecedented provisions on LPF in the agreement, including also on enforcement tools. The Commission is fully committed to make the effective use of all these tools that we have at our disposal. They include such measures like diplomacy, consultation mechanism, and different enforcement mechanism, including, for example, domestic enforcement, tailor-made and new horizontal and horizontal dispute settlement, as well as unilateral tools. Now, on rebalancing measures, uh, we could not be more prescriptive during the negotiations because we wanted to have a mechanism which would address a broad and a known range of potential regulatory actions taken by the UK in the future. At the same time, I want to underline that we could not agree with the UK to their alignment to EU standards. That was clearly a red line for them. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, we considered that this would go beyond the type of relationship that we were seeking with the Union, with the UK, in view of the negotiating mandate that we received from our member states and the resolution of the European Parliament. At the same time, we have measures uh, which allow us to react when the regulatory divergence is significant and has a material effect on trade or investment. It will be for the Union to make such a case on the basis of the evidence that we would gather in future, uh, including also in cooperation with uh, uh, stakeholders, civil society. Now, more specifically on the uh, emission trading schemes, uh, the UK has an obligation under the agreement to establish an effective system of carbon pricing. Uh, it would have to be essentially uh, a system with the same scope as the one in the Union. This obligation is linked to the UK commitment not to regress from levels of protection, 
Uh, and we also have a possibility to have a linking agreement, which would ensure uh, even more uh, alignment of our two systems. Now, on top of that, of course, there is also a possibility to apply rebalancing measures in the case there were significant divergences between those two systems. Now, colleagues from DigiClima uh, very closely follow the developments on the UK side related to their ETS system, because this is one of the priority areas in the level playing field area. Uh, I, I hope that I responded to questions raised uh, today. Thank you. Perfect. So, uh, this concludes the answering from the uh, task force DG Trade and from the EIS. And to sum up, uh, I will give now the floor to our two rapporteurs. Kati Piri, for around about two, three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to all the colleagues who participated in this debate. And of course, also uh, many thanks to the Commission and the EAS for also answering the questions by the colleagues. Um, I have taken uh, um, note of your both your support and, of course, still of some outstanding concerns. And thanks to the work of you and your committees, we are fully on track to ensure that the agreement's thorough democratic scrutiny before the end of the period of the provisional application can be done by this parliament. Now, a lot of questions and remarks have been made on the democratic role of the parliament. And I think it's absolutely clear that we need to have clear guarantees on level playing field um, provisions that are fully enforceable. And that includes, of course, the clarity on what actions actually constitute a breach, a transparency on how non-regression and rebalancing provisions can be triggered, and certainty that the required burden of proof for doing so is not unfeasible in praxis. Colleagues, uh, it's, it's uh, what the chair has just asked me to do is to do a sum up. That's impossible in two, three minutes, but we have all been in this debate. Let me just say as a final word that this is probably the most strategic partnership agreement that the EU ever concluded. And let us also use this agreement as a solid foundation to build our special partnership with the UK for now and in the future. Thank you all. Thanks a lot, Gatti. And uh, now it's Christoph Hansen, also two, three minutes, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bernd. Uh, and uh, well, I will go to some of the points that the colleagues uh, have mentioned. Maybe the first one, which is, of course, an, a very important uh, that has uh, been mentioned by uh, Barry Andrews, but uh, Antonio Fernandez Martos already replied to it. The proper uh, implementation of the withdraw withdrawal agreement is, of course, crucial uh, as well for the uh, trust that is needed for the future for our relationship. So I think it is very important. And in the resolution, we will uh, highlight this again that the proper implementation of the withdrawal agreement is really crucial uh, for this parliament. Uh, Mrs. Svenja Hahn made the remark, and uh, I, I heard as well, Bernd, that I have to go once to uh, Hamburg to see this uh, beautiful city. I've never been, but it's on the bucket list. No, but on the more serious side, uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, UK cap and trade system, we still need to see uh, how it is uh, working in uh, practice. Um, we have some doubts as well. But I, I've, uh, the, I'm the shadow rapporteur as well in the ANVI committee, so I had the honor to present uh, our opinion yesterday. And uh, what I mentioned there, what is very important, is that we have the linking of both systems uh, as soon as possible. But because the more we wait, the more there will be divergences. And this will, of course, uh, uh, cause major problem of linking those systems. And we have experience with the Swiss linking that is, uh, this can be quite uh, painful to do so. Um, on the other points, um, 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 Nathalie Loiseau, Madame Fotiga, Michel Gala, and as well, colleague Mian Mon mentioned, of course, uh, or regretted that we don't have uh, much on foreign uh, on foreign policy, on security, and on the defence policy. Of course, this has not been uh, the choice of the European Union. We would have uh, preferred to go further, but our doors uh, remain open, and I think that is very important. And we hope and we are looking forward that uh, in the future, once we are properly settled, uh, that uh, those negotiations can uh, be um, let as well. <coughs> 
Then as well, um, Lisa Skrinemarker uh, want, uh, was um, uh, as well on the rebalancing uh, uh, system uh, that uh, mechanism that this is a uh, very important and that we t we have to uh, that um, this uh, demonstrate that it has to be useful that we can uh, easily uh, trigger this balancing uh, mechanism. This has uh, something where we really need to work and we will have to follow up ag again. So thank you for that remark. And then many of the colleagues uh, remarked as well uh, the need for the inter, inter institutional agreement, uh, or at least at this stage, uh, to get a written, um, uh, written statement by the European Commission uh, for the proper involvement at all the different stages, at all the different modification rendezvous clauses that we have, that the Parliament is properly informed, is properly involved, and is as well properly debriefed after all these meetings. So uh, we have now this letter that we have uh, I have announced in the beginning, uh, where the Parliament, and this, has, has, uh, this is coming from uh, the Conference of Presidents uh, directly, where we really want the uh, Commission to commit to this proper um, information of the Parliament, and I think uh, this could lead in, in the future into an inter-institutional agreement like uh, Paulo de Castro, like Heidi Hautala, and several others have mentioned it. But this is, was just roughly my three minutes are already over, so thank you very much. And we, uh, Kati Piri and myself, will do our utmost to include as much of your remarks as possible into our future works. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Of course, this will be a busy week, the next week, for the two rapporteurs. So the Conference of Presidents and the UK Coordination Group decided to stick to the timetable we agreed on. Uh, of course, there are rumors about extension. Nobody knows exactly. But we will stick in our work to this timetable. This means that the deadline for amendments will be the 8th of February. And then we will have a vote in inter and AFED afterwards. The concrete uh, date is not uh, uh, fixed yet, but it will be in week seven. And then to the original timetable, the vote in plenary is foreseen on the 23rd of February. But we will see if this will stick. But uh, the deadline for amendments is there, 8th of February. Point four, any other business? Nothing. And point five, next meeting, I mentioned that will be in week seven. And this concludes the meeting. Thanks a lot. All the best. Have a nice weekend. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.